You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I'm David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests. And my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk radio network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, or any other places that you get your podcast. Uh, please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. And as a reminder, I do gratitude keynote speaking and coaching and you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com, or as you can see in the YouTube, thatgratitudeguypodcast.com as well. So let me get on with the show and introduce my guest. And my guest, I think after doing the podcast now for a couple of years, may be one of my longest known people in my life that I've known for many years. I'm going to have him talk about that in a second. But uh, Bob Corsetto, I met many years ago, and he's got quite a colorful and storied career, done a lot of different things in his life, and uh, he and I have remained close friends over all these years, which is quite a feat in itself sometimes, the way people change and so forth. So, Bob, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, David. It is good to have you here. So, for those that are common listeners or current listeners to the podcast, I always start with the same question, and then I end up with a uh, the similar, uh, different question, but the same every podcast. And so let me start out and tell the listeners how, in your recollection, how you and I met. Well, in my recollection, it was uh, when I was shopping at Bush Blums in the 70s to buy a suit. Uh, <clears throat> a friend of mine told me to I should go there because it would make my stocky, bulbous body look better. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, that's where, and Dave uh, said, <clears throat> did you... Uh, did you have a father that taught school? And uh, I said, no, that was me. So uh, in 1963, he was in the seventh grade at Catherine Blaine Junior High School <clears throat> and I was teaching science. And the first day he was in class, I caught him passing a note to <laughs> a girl. Uh, in fact, it was Carol Bertram <clears throat> and uh, read it out loud to the class. I guess you don't do that type of thing today, but uh, uh, anyway, um, I don't remember it, but I, uh, he reminded me of it. And from 1973 on, we've been good friends. That is a very accurate recollection, I must say, because sometimes I'll ask people how we met and gosh, I go, really? That's a little different than I remember. But not only was it 63, not only was it uh, science, not only were you the teacher, you got the name of the girl right. As I'm passing the notes, see if I can walk her home from school. I'm 13 years old, trying to make friends. I'm brand new to the school and uh, had the note read in front of everybody. So that was, that was quite an introduction. So if you take that total time from that time to today, 2022, that is a number of years. So, well, I mentioned too, without going into too much the detail, 59 but- to be exact, Dave. I beg pardon? 59 to be exact. 59, yeah. <clears throat> and um, you had a quite a, you've had quite a colorful career in my opinion. You've done a lot of different things. So maybe not going back to high school, but high school on to college and right after that, talk a little bit about kind of the journey uh, in the work world that you started way back when and how you kind of went and did some of the things that you did. Well, it, it really goes back way before high school, Dave. My dad was a school teacher and the way he made enough money to live comfortably was buying old houses and fixing them up so and then selling them so from the time i was about eight years of age i worked every weekend uh helping him and a couple of his workers uh, uh remodel homes and that went on until i was old enough to get a job at about 14. Uh, but it also i would say because my mother uh father was a entrepreneur and had a chicken hatchery in Winlock, Washington, kind of spiked the entrepreneurial spirit, even though I didn't know that at the time. 
So that evolved into my father wanted me to become a teacher, I mean, a uh, dentist. So when I went to college, I uh, took pre-dent and had, I have about a hundred hours of science, which uh, I wish then I'd known what I found out in the 1980s to make my strengths productive and my weaknesses irrelevant uh, because I would have never even gone down that path. So I have a college degree in chemistry, one in speech, and uh, a master's in education administration. So uh, where I'm going with that, after college, I didn't get accepted to dental school the first time. And uh, so I went, uh, I became a teacher like my parents. And that's how I met Dave. But after I got my master's degree and had a four point, uh, I got accepted to dental school. But fortunately for me, my uh, first wife, I'd put through dental hygiene school. And by that time I knew I was 27 years of age. I knew I didn't want to be a, uh, a dentist. So uh, uh, again, being in the same spot my father was in, uh, I would worked as a carpenter in the summer uh, to make ends meet as a teacher. And at the end of, uh, I think I was 26 years old and decided there's, there's got to be another way. And a friend of mine saw something in me that uh, I didn't see in myself. In fact, I was just talking with him the other day and I said, Tom, how did, uh, uh, how did you uh, even push me in that direction? He said, well, you're the best salesman I've ever met. Wow. And, uh, so he introduced me to three guys that were looking for recruits in the life insurance business. So I started selling life insurance part-time while I was uh, po working on my postgraduate work. And uh, in three years, my income as a life insurance salesman is more than it was as a, as a head counselor in a junior wow. high school. So uh, my father uh, talked it over with him and I, my goal was to become a superintendent of school so I wouldn't have a boss. If, I don't know if anybody could ever be that naive. The right. whole world's looking down your throat. But uh, uh, I was going to Columbia University for a doctorate and asked them if I could postpone it for a year and went uh, into the life insurance business for a year full time. And my income the first year, well, I broke an industry record at that time for first year sales. And my income had been 84,000 a year as a, uh, as a uh, head counselor. And I made 83,000 in selling life insurance. So you do the math. Yeah. So I, I stayed in the insurance business. That was 1966. By 1968, decided, well, what happens if you don't die? Uh, and so I started a very embryonic financial planning business, which uh, at that time, it took maybe an hour or two to explain to somebody what it was. It wasn't commonplace like it is today. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that, that evolved uh, then into uh, a, um, a diversified stream of incomes, which, as David knows, is kind of my, my motto. All my companies are start with the name Diversified. And if there's anything I'd recommend to people on this call uh, or on this podcast is uh, if you can get multiple streams of income in your life, because you never know when one of those streams will uh, dry up. Right, right. That's so true. And, and let me jump back a little bit. I'm interested, just a couple of things, and then we'll, we'll bring it up to the diversified. So your dad wants you to be a dentist. And then by the time... Uh, your wife went through dental hygiene school and then at 27, you, what, what, what made you decide not, I mean, 27 isn't that old. What made you not decide to become a dentist? Well, I was already, dental, uh, I was already uh, selling life insurance part-time. Oh, okay. And I loved uh, the, uh, uh, the sales aspect of it. I can remember my, uh, they, all they did for training was give me a rate book and sent me out in the field. And, uh, my first call was a farmer up on Woodby Island and I went and talked to him and I was going through the rate book and he said, uh, uh, how long have you been in the business? <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, about six months. So anyway, I sold him an insurance policy and I'd been there about two hours and I walked out and I, re I realized I'd made $204. Wow. And at that time, I was uh, bringing home $343 a month. Wow. Teacher. And the light came on. You don't want to work by the hour anymore. You yeah. want to work work uh, uh, on the, per sale, and because that was over half my monthly income at two hours. Wow. So that's when I decided when dental. I I didn't want to work by the hour. I wanted to work on commissions. 
Yeah. And you mentioned this guy, Tom, uh, that was kind of the first one that recruited you into the life insurance business. And I know it's always, at least no, it is for me. He didn't recruit me, Dave. He just referred me. He was in the, another side of the insurance business, but it was just a dear friend, Tom. Oh, okay. Okay. So he referred me to some, introduced me to some people that he thought would benefit me and them. Or planted the seed or whatever. So, yeah. Um, so with him and or with you going into that, I know it's it's always difficult for me to objectively talk about myself, but uh, with that being understood, what, what would you say made you so successful? Because you, you, you're talking to this farmer and the next thing you know, you've made $204, I think you said, and you're, you're selling life insurance policies and it's always, maybe it's even you that told me, and I've heard many times about you know death and taxes and people don't want to talk about dying and paying money and things and insurance costs money and it talks about when you die. So what do you think it was about your sales technique, your personality, your ability that made you successful early on from there? Uh, I don't know for sure. I, I can tell you this, that people, most people that have a unique ability don't appreciate their unique ability. They assume that everybody can do it. And talking with people, learning about people, finding out what makes them tick has always been part of my DNA. And uh, that's better than going to a good movie to sit down and talk to somebody for an hour, and just ask them questions about themselves and find out what makes them tick and what made them successful and what makes them happy, et cetera. And so I, uh, even at my age now, I'm, I just love to talk to people. So that, and uh, the other thing is I don't, uh, as you said, with life insurance, you're talking about dying and spending money. Uh, well, I've had two people call me in my entire career wanting to buy life insurance. And both of them ended up being uninsurable. Oh, wow. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, I, you know, rejection uh, doesn't bother me. Didn't bother me, doesn't bother me. Yeah, and that's certainly part of it. And I think, I've met a number of people in the insurance business besides you, and they've said, yeah, one or two times if somebody called and said, I need to get some insurance. And so it's something that uh, the referrals and dealing with the rejection and so forth has a lot to do with it. And I like something, I just wrote this down that you said that uh, people that have a unique ability don't realize that they have that unique ability. And I think that ties back into lack of self-esteem, lack of self-confidence. And it's really a shame because uh, I even talk in some of my talks, one module about when somebody pays you a compliment, the average person will discount the compliment. And, and, uh, you know, it's like, I love your, your, your ham dinner. Yeah. But the potatoes were terrible. And you go, don't say that, just say, thank you. I appreciate that. And so forth. And so what, in terms of knowing the, the psychology piece and knowing people as well, people that have that unique ability don't realize that they have it. Why do you think that's the case with the, with the human beings, if you will? Oh, I think you hit on it partially. I, I think it's low self-concept. Uh, and uh, for one, we, they were raised in a, uh, uh, I, I guess, as an old friend of mine said, you know, I mentioned a while ago that uh, make your strengths productive and your weaknesses irrelevant. Another way of putting it is to uh, uh, feed your strengths and starve your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And one of the bad things about life, I think, with a lot of parenting and teachers particularly, is they always focus on what you're not doing well, right? What you're not doing right, what you're doing right. And uh, uh, I'm just, uh, uh, my philosophy has been in raising children and teaching school is always focusing on what you do well and forget about what you don't do so well. And, um, and I, I remember hearing from somebody, I might be heard from a couple of places where uh, sort of humorously, if we had focus on the negatives, people, little babies would never learn, none of us would ever be walking because you stupid little baby, you can't even walk and he takes a step and falls down. But what do we do? We encourage that little baby. Oh my gosh, he just took a half a step and then, then it's two steps and, and so forth. And yet we, we don't follow that model later on in life, it seems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and then the low self-concept, what, what do you think? Again, I think of you as such a people person. And as you said, nothing like having a conversation with somebody, what would you, you know, again, I always look for tips and takeaways, low self-esteem, low self-concept, what do you think are some ways that people that suffer from that or deal with that can improve that? Well, I, I think, well, first of all, we're, I've always, one of my questions to people is uh, who was the nurturing person in your life? Because anybody that's successful that I've run into had somebody that nurtured them. Mm -hmm. In my case, it was my mother primarily. 
but uh, many times that your parents weren't the person, it might've been a coach, might've been a teacher, might've been a friend of your parents, uh, et cetera. I, I had a, a good friend of mine, uh, a good friend of my father's that used to paint houses with me, C.H. Uh, Heffelfinger, who you probably had as a teacher at uh, Queen Anne High School, mm. I taught history, but he was the, uh, I don't know, again, with you, Dave, you, uh, he was teaching the gifted students. So, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, who, I, I don't think I had him. <clears throat> so it was, I developed an incredible background in history just listening to him because he's one of the best history scholars written several books that I've ever met. Hmm. So uh, if you can find different mentors throughout your life, I think that makes a big difference in uh, building your self-concept. And did you have other notable mentors in your life? Yes, I, <clears throat> I can find, I, I, even in the life insurance business, I worked part-time for three different companies until I went full-time. So I had four general agents that were all a little bit different. And I was able to pick from each one their strengths and they became my strengths. So uh, I would say, you can learn something from every boss you ever had. You can learn something from whoever you worked with uh, and just look for their strengths. Don't worry about their weaknesses and see if you can uh, uh, put that in your own package and build your own personality and self-concept. Yeah, and that's such a good, and you've said it a couple of times. Uh, my final question, which I know this will be an answer, but I'll probably have you come up with another one is make your strengths productive, make your weaknesses irrelevant, because I really embraced that uh, over the years, and I'm sure I heard it from you, uh, and I think you told me who you heard it from, but I think it's so important, and, and I even use it as an example in my talks about uh, I, can, I can speak to 10,000 soldiers very comfortably down at Joint Base Lewis-McChord, but I can't draw a circle to save my life, but I'm not going to go take an art class. It's just, it doesn't make any sense to me to go try to figure out how to draw a good circle, you know, and I'd rather focus on what I'm good at and so forth. And so, but I think, but so move into a little bit, and I'm, I'm going to talk about your personal life in a little bit too, specifically your family and your children. You've got some, um, been very successful in the family world with all your kids and grandkids and so forth. And so, but talk a little bit more as we moved on in past insurance, because I want to make sure the listeners hear a little bit more of that, because as I say, you've done a lot of different things. And so talk about some of the next uh, things that happened to you after you moved on past the insurance business. Well, I didn't. Uh, I've, I've never moved past the insurance business. Uh, I've, that's always been uh, one of the spokes of the wheel, so to speak. Uh, but uh, in the 70s, uh, myself and my brother and another individual uh, started a merger and acquisition business. And uh, one of the companies we bought was O'Brien Water Ski Company from, uh, from the bank after they'd been busted for smuggling dope in hollowed out water skis. Mm. And uh, so in two years, we turned that around and sold it to Coleman, the camp stove people and so on. And uh, then in 1977, I was, I just got a divorce and I'd uh, made a lot of money. So I decided to retire and uh, I moved to Sun Valley, Idaho. And it took me three years to uh, become an alcoholic. So I had all mm -hmm. that free time. And <clears throat> so uh, fortunately I met a woman, my second wife who uh, got me to quit drinking and that uh, changed my life. We went on to have two more children as well. And, uh, uh, that uh, so that's when I went back into the uh, uh, financial consulting or strategic planning business, and uh, I, I uh, one of the other things I might mention uh, there is something out there by Gallup called "Now Discover Your Strengths" or "Strengths Finder," mm. and uh, about twenty years ago I took that and found out that they what my five signature strengths were out of thirty four. Mm. And I've all my children take that, and uh, it, it's very helpful. And the reason I bring that up, uh, my number one uh, strength, signature strength, is uh, being an activator. And it says an activator cannot not do. And uh, but the problem with that, I've gotten in trouble in my life in two or three instances where I'd moved too fast, and I didn't have a strategic partner. So. Uh, Leading on to in 1977, uh, 1987, uh, I <clears throat> had raised the money for a gold mine to buy gold mining equipment and 
uh, mine, uh, placer mining on the Moab River down in, uh, I mean, Colorado River in Moab, Utah. And to make a long story short, the uh, gold miner walked away with uh, $2.6 million. Wow. And uh, so that forced me into bankruptcy. Mm. And so I had to start over in 1988 uh, from scratch. Uh, again, I had the life insurance to back me up and within a couple of years uh, was back on my feet. And uh, then uh, remember I mentioned in the beginning about diversified streams of income mm -hmm. or multiple streams of income. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> I was exposed to uh, another dear friend of mine who uh, out of the Salt Lake area about uh, a network marketing company and got in uh, with Rexall showcase. And I got involved in that. And I've been involved in the network marketing business uh, uh, for since 1992. So it'd be 30 years. And uh, that plus the life insurance business, plus the street strategic planning uh, have given me multiple streams of income over the years and a lot of diversity, uh, diversity and a lot of safety. Yeah, yeah. And then, and just a word, because I know this has been a big chunk of that too after Rexall was uh, just a word or two about the isogenics experience, because I know that was very impactful for you. Well, it's, uh, again, it generates, uh, uh, you know, can help supplement your retirement, but uh, that, that was a big thing. But isogenics also have some products that uh, are pretty dramatic and uh, uh, they've got the best protein um, powder on the on the market from uh, they get that from uh, New Zealand where uh, the Chinese have tied up most of the market but uh, the whey protein there is is top number one grade out of seven because they have what they call contented cows mm. they only have their cows uh, nine months a year and there are no steroids no hormone hormones etc cetera, etc cetera. but wow. that's uh, again that goes back that's very similar to uh, uh, the life insurance business because uh, the easiest way to uh, uh, get someone to stop talking to you on the airplane, if they ask you what you do, tell them you sell life insurance or you're with Amway. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. So it's funny though. It's been, tra I'm traveling a lot lately. And my experience has been this people don't just seem to, they may not want to talk to you if you're telling them it's Amway or life insurance, but they sure don't have any trouble talking about themselves. I just, uh, I, I'm still, I'm still nodding my head sometimes an hour into the flight, still listening to that person. And then I did this and then I did that. And I just think, gosh, you know, maybe we'll have an opportunity to talk about what I do, but it's funny how that works. But so then as you, so before I want to get in touch on the family a little bit, especially with your kids, but a little bit uh, from Isogenics Beyond and other things, you to me are a good example of somebody that gets to be of a certain age where you kept active and kept uh, going. And I feel I saw a, a survey or an article the other day about uh, people that have a purpose live seven to 10 years longer than people that don't have. So uh, talk a little bit about the last 10 or 15 years in terms of you knowing you very well, you kept very active and uh, in some of these different, you know, um, modalities, if you will, the insurance world, the financial planning, the network marketing with Isagenics. Hasn't that been a really key to keeping you really uh, youthful, if you will? Uh, <clears throat> I'd, I'd say having a purpose is definitely important. Uh, again, I do a lot of, I'd say if you put on my tombstone, what I'd like to be remembered for, it'd be teaching, coaching, and mentoring. Mm. And that's really what I am more than anything else. And uh, Again, by asking, you mentioned people talk about themselves, by asking uh, people questions, there was a book out there called Questions Are the Answer. So you've got to be able to ask good questions, but you've got to be a good listener in order to ask the next question. Right. So uh, those, those are skills that can be learned. I mean, being a great salesman, I don't know if you can learn to be a salesperson if it's not in your DNA, but anybody can become a good listener. Anybody can learn to ask good questions. And yeah. if you want to uh, have a meaningful life, I feel you want to know a bit about other people and what makes them tick and how you can help them. And by being having a service-oriented mind mindset, uh, I think that adds your longevity right there. Yeah, that's it. And that's a good point. I totally agree about, uh, I think sometimes is a good salesman born or, or, or trained or whatever, or made, whatever, 
Uh, but I think the listing thing is something that you can definitely change. I, whatever level of listener I was before, I'm a lot better listener now. And I've caught myself many times wanting to say something and just think, zip it, just keep it quiet. Let them keep talking. They'll, they'll, they'll let you know when they're done. And, and then those great three word phrases like tell me more uh, and then and then what is another great one that keeps people. And when they're done, you'll get your chance and that kind of thing, too. So uh, let me just switch gears well, just first. I might add, Dave, is that everybody in the world is a salesperson. Mm. Some just are terrible at it. Yeah, yeah. And, but you don't think you're selling something, but you're always selling yourself. That's so true. What? And I always think it's like when somebody says I'm on some of these mastermind calls and they go, uh, I don't want to sound too salesy. And everybody always has like, I'm a salesman. Oh, what do you do? Or you're just a salesman. It always has sort of a negative connotation, which I think is really a shame because frankly, unless something's sold, not much happens in the business world. And yet the, the same people that sell it are sometimes sort of looked down upon uh, as there's something less than, you know, than noble or something. But um, let me let me switch gears. And I've got about 10 minutes left and I just want to get a couple more things in. Talk a little bit as um, uh, how gratitude has been a part of your life. As you know, I'm that gratitude guy and speak about gratitude and coach and and have written books and things like that. But talk about how gratitude kind of figured into your life. Well, the, the way it started, um, I, as you know, I, I was watching The Secret. And, mm. uh, and they, uh, the, the person, the woman that put together uh, uh, The Secret, the, the entire movie and so on, wrote a, had a book on gratitude. So I sent in for that and uh, uh, started using that. And I mentioned it to you. I mean, we laugh about it all the time. I mentioned it to about 20 people and the only guy that got it was you. And look what happened yeah. to you. Yeah. About being opportunity focused. Yeah. And um, you built it into something, uh, uh, you know, ma magnificent. I'm really proud of you, actually. Well, you didn't get you. on this call to give you attaboys, but you, you deserve them. Oh, and, thank you. Uh, the, thank uh, you. I, what gratitude has done for me, and that came from my mother, uh, who got me the um, book, uh, 1953, The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale, uh, which I was only 14 years of age at the time and shows you where she was uh, being a woman of the 1920s uh, to uh, uh, be that far ahead. But that comes from her family and her father, who was a very positive guy, sailed around the world two or three times, et cetera. But it's, I don't think you can be depressed if you're grateful. Yeah. If you focus on what's good in your life and there's, I, as you know, I had some real health challenges about six years ago and, uh, if you can, uh, that's the one time in my life that uh, I was definitely clinically depressed and I wasn't able to for a few weeks to uh, focus on what was good in my life. Mm -hmm. But if you can focus on what's good in your life, it's hard to stay depressed for a long period of time. Yeah, 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 that's really true. And I just, I think some people are just, gosh, I try not to be negative around it, but it just seems like some people are just predisposed to negativity. And I had a father that was very negative and a mother that was very positive. And I just, uh, I just never understood my dad's uh, concept because it's just, uh, that's just not a very pleasant way to live. If everything is gloom and doom and negative and complaining and, and uh, I just think you have such a better, you know, journey through life. If you have a positive attitude, the glass half full versus half empty. And so um, let me ask, I want to make sure I cover this because I, I'm very proud of you for what you've raised as far as children and talk a little bit about the, not so much about your individual kids, but maybe the parenting tips and tricks for lack of a better term, because uh, as we've said many times, I, you have a lot of kids and they're all successful in their various forms. And I have a lot of friends or a number of friends that have kids at risk and have things that are kind of negative. And so you've had a very good success. And what do you kind of uh, relate that to or attribute that to? Oh, I, I think, uh... <clears throat> them having high self-concepts. I, I went to uh, a seminar called Executive Dynamics in 1968 in uh, Salishan, Oregon, and met a woman by the name of uh, Marge Brazano, who was putting together the, a Montessori school in Bellevue. And uh, she had written a book, uh, a, a song called I Like Myself. And one of the things that came from spending time with Marge is every day she looked in the mirror and uh, told herself she liked herself 10 mm. times. Mm. And so I've 
always with my from that day on with my kids i had them their ritual was uh, to look in the mirror every day and say i like myself with a smile on their face 10 times and i think uh, that had a lot to do with it and the other was uh, to figure out what their strengths were and just feed those strengths and compliment mm -hmm. them in those areas all the time and not allow uh, any i can't do it or I'm so dumb or anything of the sort, even to be talking if that that's just deleted from uh, the conversation if it comes up. Yeah. So they're all of them are opportunity focused. All of them are in fields of their that match their unique abilities. And I think that's uh, uh, an incredible opportunity opportunity. And the other thing that I've learned when I quit drinking is that there's alcoholism in both sides of my family. And fortunately, I, I was able to uh, get that message through to my kids. So none of them are alcoholics. They're practicing alcoholics. Most of my children don't drink. Yeah, so, that's really neat. And I know there's a lot. A uh, what's up? It's a risk. Yeah, and I know there's, I've seen books, you know, children of adult adults of, of alcoholic parents or children of the alcoholic parents and things. And I'm sure the, the, uh, the numbers will tell you that, uh, uh, you know, there's a higher risk that if your parents were alcoholics, that you're going to be an alcoholic and so forth. So that's, that's really neat that that chain was kind of broken and so forth. And, and uh, I, I just think again, like, my father took his own life. And then I read somewhere, well, that means that his children, my siblings and I are supposedly more at risk for suicide, which is interesting how that works. But, but I think that back to that uh, self you know, you'd never do that, Dave, you like yourself too much. Well, yeah, but you know, what's really funny. It's it, that's what's really, I think is kind of a shame is that she, she said she looked in the mirror and she said she liked herself and I'll tell somebody, maybe you and maybe a close friend or something that I walk by the mirror after getting a big speaking gig. And, and I, I tell them, I looked and I pointed myself in the mirror and I said, I'm proud of you and people snicker. And I just think it's funny because I don't think it's funny. I, I just think it's that's what we're trying to do is have a better relationship with ourselves. And I maintain that's the most important relationship you're ever going to have. Perhaps maybe if you're with your creator, if you're religious and so forth. But I just I find it interesting because it, it almost feels like you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Because they, I can think back in grade school and little Johnny over in the corner, nobody talked to him and he was real shy and said, oh, the poor thing, he has no self-esteem, no self-confidence. And then here's somebody else who's, I want to be president of the class. I want to look at him. Well, he's so cocky. He's so conceited. And it was like, you couldn't win, you know? And so it's, it's, it's that fine line because society is kind of like they, they say have confidence, but don't have too much. And in the, what an article or I wrote or something I did once was confidence and humility that, that apparently that's the, that's the combination you want is to be confident, but also be humble. So anyway, but well, we're going to wrap up. I just want to look back and just take a look at a couple of um, little tidbits and takeaways that I always think about. Of course, the find your feed your strengths and starve your weaknesses. Make your uh, um, strengths productive and your weaknesses irrelevant. Uh, who is the nurturing person in your life? Find mentors. Uh, very important. And uh, you mentioned watching The Secret, which has had a big impact on me as well, as you had told me about that. Um, teaching, coaching, and mentoring, uh, be opportunity focused. And then in the case of uh, your kids, and then also match their unique abilities. And so you mentioned about make your strengths productive, your weaknesses irrelevant. It's one of my favorites from you. So you can't answer that one, but let me ask you my final question and we'll wrap up. And that is, uh, what's one thing beyond that, that you know today that you would have liked to know at 18 that would have helped you? Um, making my strengths productive and my weaknesses irrelevant. Uh, yeah. Another one, the second one or the sidebar to that would be uh, be uh, opportunity focused rather than problem solving focused. Because mm. problem solving focused, all you ever do is get back to even. Yeah. If you find one great opportunity and run with it, you'll be rewarded beyond your wildest dreams. Yeah. Too many people focus on problem solving their problems rather than looking for opportunities yeah that's a good one opportunity focused and not focusing on just solving the problems yeah see it almost feels like one is looking backwards and one is looking forwards yeah excellent 
Well, thank you, Mr. Crescetto. And let me tell all my listeners again, as I mentioned at the top of the show, a couple of things. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time in the Transformation Talk Radio Network. It's available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. And I know that people are struggling with all sorts of life issues, and you may need additional support. So I do have a program for that that handles anxiety, depression, jobs, health, financial, family issues, and it's a gratitude coaching program that I conduct and have clients for that uh, know that if they want to achieve something, they can do anything if they set their mind to it, and it can be then taken care of. The clients that I hear back dramatically say they shorten their learning curve and get a derailed life back on track. And I offer a complimentary 30-minute coaching consultation to offer some on-the-spot coaching and see if I might be able to be helpful. And if you're interested in that, just text the word COACH to 206-371-8309. And as I mentioned, any additional information about my keynote speaking and books and journals, go to thatgratitudeguy.com. And also, people like to receive my weekly Monday morning minute video. If you'd like to get that, just simply text the word GRATITUDEGUY to 22828. That's five digits, 22828. And the word gratitude guy in the message box. And lastly, and most of all, thank you so much for tuning in and watching and listening. I appreciate it. And until next time, remember, be grateful and never quit. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Bob. You're welcome, Dave. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today. 